I'm Don Tess, better known as the Dawn of Beer. And I'm M. Sauter, better known as Pints and Panels. Welcome to the 21st episode of the All About Beer podcast. Every two weeks, we talk with leading experts and take a deep dive into one topic in beer. Visit allaboutbeer.com and follow us on social media at allaboutbeer. And visit patreon.com slash allaboutbeer to support this show and others. This week on the show, we have a really cool episode with three amazing brewers recorded live during Camp Rock Beer, which was held during the 2023 Craft Brewers Conference in Nashville. The event was sponsored by the producer of this show, All About Beer, and was held in the shadow of hundreds of barrels at Barrique Brewing. So naturally, we talk about barrel-aged beer. M, please tell me you love barrel-aged beer. Of course, I love barrel-aged beer. What is this, <laughs> Don? That's the silliest question you've ever asked. And you've yeah, asked but... some humdingers. <laughs> yeah. Um I love my, I've got, I love everything that wood can do from using pitch lining of barrels for Pilsners. I'm a, actually a huge fan of uh, bourbon barrel aged stouts and barley wines, particularly on snowy evenings. <laughs> yeah. And I, you know, uh, in past episodes, I've spoken many times about the magic of great beer. Um, of course. And I think barrel aging is is where that is really exemplified. The um the scientific knowledge of what goes on within a barrel is relatively scarce. And so barrel aged beers where brewers really have to lean into the magic that, that, uh, that uh, wood provides. Exactly. And wood is such a great vessel for all sorts of beers. And we have three great guests that are going to discuss their experiences and expertise with all things wood from their favorite barrel programs, the different fermentation styles, barrels they love and more. We'll introduce our guests and get into a conversation, but here is a word from our sponsor. And if you would like to help support the All About Beer podcast, please reach out to podcast at allaboutbeer.com. All About Beer is back, and we're asking for your support to help provide the independent beer media this rich and colorful industry deserves. Visit our website, allaboutbeer.com, where we're frequently posting new content. And please consider throwing us a few bucks at patreon.com slash allaboutbeer. We have low-cost memberships for individuals and small and large companies alike. Every dollar goes to help produce new articles and podcasts. Estrella Galicia is an independent family-owned brewery in Northwest Spain, founded in 1906. Estrella Galicia Cerveza Especial is a world-class lager, brewed using the finest Spanish malts, locally cultivated Galician hops, and the best brewing practices made out of the state-of-the-art facility in A Coruña. Recognized around the world for quality and exceptional character, Estrella Galicia is a beer like no other. To learn more about Estrella Galicia, follow them at Estrella Galicia USA on Instagram. Looking for an easy hop sourcing experience? Yakima Valley Hops offers the finest quality hops from right here in our valley and premium growing regions around the world. Get the hops you need when you need them with ultra-fast shipping and awesome customer service. With a full line of liquid hop products and all your favorite varieties, no contracts are needed to brew with the best. Shop now at yakimavalleyhops.com. That's Y-A-K-I-M-A, valleyhops.com. Brandon Jones is an avid sour beer fan. The first sour beer he tasted was Leafman's Gunbond in early 2004. From there, his love to seek out any sour beer to sample and to learn from those examples began and led to the founding of Embrace the Funk, now part of Yazoo Brewing. Many times, bacteria and wild yeast in beer are considered a flaw and beer destroyers, but a growing number of breweries, home brewers, and consumers are embracing the funk. The funk is spontaneous fermentation, wild yeast, and bacteria that give sour slash specialty beers their distinctive flavor. These types of beers have been produced for over 500 years. Jones hopes to make the world of sour beers a bit more approachable so even more people can embrace the funk. Joel Stickrod is the founder of Barrique Brewing and Blending. He moved from a modest barrel storage space into his own tap room in the heart of Nashville several years ago and is bringing his beer vision to the people. Originally, the brewery was focused on wild ales, usually blended, often fruited, and those remain on offer. But the new space has allowed him to reach out into lagers, pub ales, and rock beers done in his style. He has a passion for historical styles blending barrels and local ingredients. Augie Carton is the founder and brewer of Carton Brewing in Atlantic Highlands, New Jersey. He is also co-host of the Steal This Beer podcast. Known for his innovation with culinary ingredients in beer, he is always looking for the next bit of inspiration to present itself. Uh, welcome everybody to Camp Rauchbeer. 
Yay, Rogue Beer. Woo. Uh, tepid, tepid response. You guys can do better than that. Welcome to Camp Rogue Beer. <laughs> Thank you. God, jeez. It's <laughs> <laughs> All right, we are here uh, to record a live uh, episode of the All About Beer podcast. Which Please you should all listen to. Like it's and subscribe great, on your favorite podcast, podcast platform. Uh, we are talking about barrel aged beer, and we have uh, three wonderful guests. Uh, thank you for your time. Obviously, yes. we are all here during Craft Brewers Conference, and we are all very busy, so I appreciate that you made time for us. Uh, the topic today barrel aged beer. Yes. The best beer. The why? Wait. Well, why is barrel-aged beer the best beer? Yes, good question. Good things take time. Barrel-aged beer takes time. That is true. That is true. There's so many more options too. Uh, we have so much more access to incredibly unique flavors that we can't get out of stainless, um, unless you're adding some sort of oak spirals or cubes or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So I love the nuance, even, you know, like Joel said, good things take time, but there are so many things you can do within two to three weeks. You can do it over the course of years. Um, it is more of an evolution of taste. And I feel like, especially with the amount of craft beer out there right now, taste and evolution and what you can find in a glass. If you can find a glass of beer, you can get three different sips out of or three different uh, beers out of at the same time out of the same glass i think you've nailed it as a brewer um and i think you can only get that out of barrel aged beer or, or or oak touched beer too okay so i guess i would break down barrel aged beer into kind of three broad categories one would be clean beer in oak the second would be funky beer in oak where it's not so much the oak, but it's the microbes in the oak. And then the third would be where um, used barrels, whether they be rum barrels or, or bourbon barrels or wine barrels, add, you know, in, impart some sort of other flavor to the beer. So is that a fair breakdown? And then I guess as brewers, how do you think about the beer that you're gonna make to put into those barrels and, and, and utilize the wood and the microbes within, or not the microbes within, as the case may be. Joel, you want to start? Yeah, I'll go ahead. Um, so we approach, at, at Barrique Brewing here in Nashville, we approach uh, barrels as vessels, and we use barrels as a place to put pier for an extended period of time. We have two very diverse parts of our program. We've got one half of it that's all wild and sour beer. That beer spends two to three years of its life in barrels. And then we have the other half of it where it's lager beer, and that's a place where we put it to do its lagering phase, which is anywhere from six weeks to upwards of, oh goodness, what was the longest one we did was nine months. And that's stored cold in the walk-in. So we use neutral barrels that we're not necessarily trying to get flavor components out of, but instead use it as a vessel to age for an extended period of time. And yet though, uh it's better than stainless. So you're not trying to get flavor, but there's a reason why you're using and a barrel as opposed to a stainless vessel. Price is, is obviously one throughout the course of history, still to the day, the cheapest place to put any liquid for an extended time is oak. Oh. And there also is nuances that come from it. Um, two to three years on the wild program, we get a lot of tannins that come out of them. Generally, we buy neutral barrels out of California where they're done getting oak flavors, but those are in temperature controlled warehouses. We're not temperature controlled. We're in Tennessee, just south of Kentucky. We go through summers. It is, it is hot. It's, it's hot and we go right in now. and out of the wood. <laughs> um, but there definitely is nuances in the lager beer that isn't there if it's in stainless. Right. Uh, Augie, I think uh, I associate you, it, it, you know, you have a strong culinary background and I think you like to play with really weird barrels, non-traditional barrels uh, in your barrel program. Can you talk about that? So I'm gonna go back to your three categories and say basically the same thing, but my way. The most magical beers I've ever had came out of wood, but it was mostly time, patience, and you know, wild ferment, time, and you know, patience, right? So when I drink things like Bone and all those other ones, I wanna make those beers. 
and I just know how they do it, and I try to do it, and every now and then a barrel's right, and we bottle that one, and that's it. We just dump a bunch of other barrels, because sometimes it's magic, and I don't have all those cultures, and that's a risk I take. But then the other two times, it's I'm drinking the spirit, and I taste something in a, that I taste in beers, and I think those two will go together. So You're, you're trying to connect hands, I yeah, guess. Yeah, so like we, I have a favorite rum that tastes like Bananas Foster when I drink it. So to me, that made sense to make a unspiced, spiced porter and put that into that barrel and just fucking wait. And then the other time is, I really love the sweetness a good fresh barrel can give to a very dry beer, right? So that's the third time. So I think that's what you're saying. It's just, for my approach, it's the only way these happen is if you wait and are willing to get rid of bad shit and embrace good shit. And then the other two are that's an ingredient and that's a flavoring do you guys have a favorite barrel program from another brewery that you're like holy shit they nail it yeah bone <laughs> I mean one of the uh, one of my favorite barrel programs um, just year, years and years ago was still at Cricket's Dave um, I think what uh, what Chad was doing uh, a decade ago in the United States uh, set us all into a um, into a path of thinking about using brandy barrels, not just on dark beers, uh, but using them on uh, mixed culture beers, Britannomyces beers, um, different adjuncts or not. Um, you know, it's very easy to say, oh, it's a dark liquid, you know, let's put a dark beer in there. Um, but I think Chad got us thinking about a, a lot of different a lot of different ways of, uh, of going about it. Uh, if I had to look over um, at different parts of the world, um, I still think that Cantillon does an amazing job with what Jean selects. Uh, you know, Jean is very into wine grapes. Um, some of his, um, so, some of the uh, barrels he's able to procure make you think of it in an even, uh, in, in even deeper depth of, uh, of character. I, I look at things always as a place and time. Um, one of my favorite characters out of barrels is is that musty cellar kind of. Um, you're just hanging out in a basement type of uh, type of experience, and that's what I look for in a lot of our beers. Um, so, especially like if you, when you you walk into Cantillon, and I'm not comparing ours to Cantillon, but what I'm saying is the inspiration being there. Um, it's a place in time. So when you're distinctly part of of an aromatic that reminds you, uh, or a flavor that reminds you of that um, of, of what you picked up, yeah, I. I think what, what, what both of them have done have inspired me for years and years and years. How, how much of, um, obviously when you um, put a beer into a barrel, uh, a lot of it is out of your control then in terms of, well, first of all, temperature you mentioned, but also the microbes that might be living in there. So when you are brewing a beer, how much intent can you put into the base beer? And then what do you have to do to manage uh, and or blend away or blend into the resulting flavor, which is the resulting flavor, which is not predictable at the get-go. Joel? Uh, so for our wild beer program, we blend everything. And we brew base beers based on what we need for the cellar and for what we need for stock. But almost never do I brew a batch of beer, put it in barrel, and package that barrel out as it is and or blend it with only that batch of beer. I blend it five, six times throughout the course of its life. Um, it starts its life leaving the brew house, going through the cool ship every night. At this point, all of our wild beer goes through the cool ship. About 80% of our production probably then goes into 12 open top wine barrels, which are barrels standing on end with one head removed. And we ferment a 20 barrel batch in 12 open top wine barrels. From then, it gets blended out of 12 individual fermentations into a barrel, stays for through one summer, and usually gets blended after that first summer, and then gets blended again when it goes on to fruit the next summer, gets blended when it comes off fruit, gets blended when it goes into the bottling tank. So it's blended five or six times throughout its life, and almost never with the same batch of beer. So we'll take funky beer and blend it with sour beer. We'll take beautiful beer and blend it with just kind of straightforward neutral beer. We'll create the flavor profile that we're looking for 
by using other barrels in our cellars. Right. And I only have barriques in, in our cellar. So we've got about 500 wild barrels and only small 225 liter barrels. We don't do anything in fooder and we approach it as multiple small beers from one batch. Right. Brandon? Um, I am, <laughs> because I'm a big whiskey fan and bourbon fan, I love single barrel stuff. Um, I'm, I think, and also coming from a television background and doing live television, getting it right, um, and I'm not saying, and that's not a, you know, you gotta blend it five times worth of thing, because um, I drink Joel's beer all the time and love it, and I think Joel is doing an incredible job here. Um, but I love that that single barrel, you, you put it in there and you got it right with the first run. Um, I, that's one of my favorite things about whiskey and bourbon and some of these stuff that goes on, uh, that uh, some of the Lambic producers are doing. Um, now we blend, uh, we do have fooders uh, at Yazoo at the Embrace the Funk Cellar. We, we have four fooders. I don't work with a lot of uh, 225 liter uh, barrels anymore. I really like punchins uh, for me because I do most of my work solo. Uh, the larger the batch, I think I get more consistency in it. But that's there's no right or wrong way to do it as long as you're trying to as long as you're hitting what your goal is um, at the end, that's great. I don't really do a whole lot of blending um, past what um, the way I back build my recipes is I buy barrels based upon what I'm trying to achieve. Um, and we've been fortunate. That's not to say I'm like some great brewer, but we've been very fortunate to hit marks that I feel like are are above and beyond what we have tried to what we try to set out to do. Um, that's not to say there's not outliers. We just did uh, we just did an eight way collaboration with um, uh, with uh, Russian River and Jester King, Green Bench, Allagash, River Bend. Yeah, um, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> This is the South, so I don't know, Augie, if you know how NASCAR sponsorship name dropping works. Nailed it. Okay. Well, I'm about to learn you. Um, <laughs> Nailed so, it. Um, uh, but when you're working with something like that, um, you're trying to pull all these ideas together. There, uh, there were some outliers, and there were a few barrels that we just did not use because I, you know, I felt like they. I, I just don't usually blend things out. That's that's my process. Right. If I don't like a barrel, I just typically destroy it. And I don't want to think about it because in my mind, that did not happen the way that I wanted it to, so I'm done with it. Um, I'd rather just move on and not try to fix it. I would rather, that's, that's just the way my process works over there because when I'm blending, I mean, some of these barrel, some of these batches are 40, 60 barrel blends that I'm trying to accomplish, and that's a lot of oak. So um, I take a lot of, uh, lot of advice from, uh, from Lauren at, at New Belgium that there is you know, there are days you get it right, uh, and everything everything went the way you wanted it to. But then there are some ways, or some things in your cell that are just never going to work. So just don't even worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's such a small amount, really, when you get down to it. And the the availability of wild and mixed culture and sour beer now, we can only put our best foot forward. And I can't be brought down by thinking about being hung up on 50 gallons of beer that just didn't work out for me. I can't do that. So, yeah, would, which is why I love, which is why I love single barrel stuff so much. That's what makes me feel great. Right. When we nail a single barrel batch, I, I truly love that. I, I would actually just add, like, in my head, of those things we just talked about, if I'm making like a mixed culture wild ferment, this just needs to be amazing, and that's going to happen over three to five years. I start three barrels, hoping one makes it, and the other two will go away at some point on that process, and. You know, in the cleaner world, let's call it two to one, one to one. But in the dirty world, it's just like, look, let's put, let's make three barrels, put them down. If one makes it to the end, we won. And if none make it to the end, we suck. And if three are right at the end, it's like the biggest feast you've ever had, right? Like, just get it right. I think we, I mean, we're very fortunate too right now. If you think even like a decade ago, um, the, my, my program professionally is a little over a decade old now. Um, the availability of different nuanced barrels, of how many, gosh, I mean, having like the, uh, the access to 20, 30-year-old sherry casks, that wouldn't have happened 20 years ago, but we've had importers to work with, a lot of the brewers that have finally caught on to what we're trying to do with these barrels, and we're trying to create these amazing 
you know, liquid experiences for people. And the fact that we can just get like, you know, PX barrels and we can just order these things now, even, I mean, I sound like an old person in the room here, but that blows my mind from when I was doing this. I mean, I've been making mixed culture and wild beer for over 20 years. And that just blows my mind that I can, I could probably pick up my phone right now and order a 30 year old uh, PX sherry barrel and have it here and, and have it here in Nashville within 10 days. That, wow. that blows my mind. And those were so hard to source. I mean, nobody had that stuff. Six uh, weeks. You know, you were lucky to get some sort of, uh, you know, some sort of like white wine barrel or red wine barrel that was hopefully good and hopefully sulfided and you know and stabilized in some great way. But wow, I mean, some of these uh, barrel producers now, they're they are next level with how they are stabilizing these barrels before they ship them to us. That we don't even have to worry about it anymore. When I first started getting barrels, I mean, we used to do pressure checks and leak checks and you know, we're buying, we're spending $500, $600 on these casks and barrels, and we're washing some of this nuance down the drain because, you know, we're making sure they don't leak, and, and some I should have checked a little better. <laughs> There's one beer that comes to mind, and it was called Never Again. <laughs> never say never again, either. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that was a wild one, too. Um, we had purchased some... Um, about 10 years ago, we'd purchased some Oloroso Sherry casks. They're about 40 years old. And uh, they did. They looked like they came off like Pirates of the Caribbean, Davy Jones' ship. They smelled amazing. Uh, they held liquid for, I don't know if you know, like, people don't know how they make sherry a lot of times. It's an oxidative uh, method. So some producers will actually separate the staves at the top to create more oxygen ingests. Um, really? Yeah, yeah, some producers will, and I'm not saying every producer, and I am certainly not the authority on Sherry, but from what I've been told in, in time, uh, in, time in, in Europe, that that, that that will happen. That helps kind of speed the process up, too, from that ox, uh, oxygen ingest. So, and also the staves at the top of some of the Sherry casts, uh, the older ones, the ones that were, you know, that were coopered in, you know, the 70s and late 60s, they will shave down the top because you get that head space and you get that loss and you get that concentration of the of the more oxidative uh, dark cherry and uh, dark fruit character to it. So we get these barrels in, the beer that Joel is talking about, and uh, they smell great, they look great, you know, they look really cool, and they're just leaking everywhere. It's, you know, and we were, we were down in the gulch at this time, and they're leaking like right next to our bright tanks where we run our Hefeweizen or our IPAs. And so we ended up having to blend so much of this with different wine barrels, whiskey barrels, uh, rye barrels. It is, you know, it's the most crazy screwed up blend that I think I've ever done unintentionally. Um, and it's a beer that I could never reproduce because most of the beer spent some time in sherry casks. And so again, you have that time and you have that place and you have that whole, here's what happened in this time capsule of this liquid. So that was actually one of the number one requested beers to remake. And I was like, guys, you know the story here. Like, I can't reproduce, nor do I want to reproduce this. I, you know, my heart can't take this anymore. <laughs> so what I do four years later, make a beer called Never Say Never Again, where I tried to recreate the whole process, minus the leakage, though. So it turned out pretty good, too. And you How as, like, brewers and owners do you, like, because barrels take like feeding and caring and like what can you do to make sure your barrels are in the best shape possible probably buy from a reputable per, uh, supplier that's exactly what i was going to say is yeah when, as we look around my cellar most of them are from large wine manufacturers there's lots of justin lots of la crema lots of candle jackson they know how to take care care of their barrels when they show up they're in great shape if you buy it from a boutique mom and pop winery, that might be a little bit cash strapped. They might have 20 barrels and not 2,000. They're in worse shape oh. coming to me from a broker than these large wineries. Well, the, the only other thing I would add to that as an owner slash brewer is we do what we do because I want to make sure we have those beers. But over 12 years, there's these slices of time where one person was responsible for the program and loved it. And you really shouldn't fool around if you don't have that person on the team because they're the ones who have to go upstairs literally every day and look at everything and touch it. If it's like, oh, let's go check on that preposterous thing Augie wants to do, it's, it's 
the care won't be there. So you gotta have somebody on the team that just wants to go be in the wood. And actually, going back to your first, when you talked about who I'd give a nod to besides us, I think Andy at Avery has somehow managed to do some of the greatest mixed culture beers in the world without anybody ever noticing because Andy at Avery loves his barrels. And I think, you know, what your place does right, what your place does right, what I try to do right is having the guy who just, that's what they do, or the, the person, that's what they do. I, th I think that's as important as who you buy from it. And the person that goes in every day and cares about the barrel, and like, you know Lauren, you listen to Lauren talking about her barrels, they have names. That's yeah. who you need in the cellar. And when you're heading up a barrel program, it, it, it does take a level of maturity too, because it is exciting to have these liquids available to you, but I don't taste any of my barrel aged beer for at least 90 to 100, 120 days. I was just say, I let it go through a I summer. Mean, oversampling has killed so many barrel programs, whether they know it or not. Um, I've been to breweries that I, as you know, 15 years ago, that I highly respected, that had a fall off, that when I visited it, and they're doing tours, and they're pulling nails, and they're pulling out for 15 people a day, and they're just, you can just watch the bubbler, or you can watch, and they're using airlocks, and I'm like, you guys don't see all this oxygen coming in here? <laughs> and so it does take a level of maturity, too. And, and no, I, I, I don't mean seven. I mean, somebody in the team has to love yeah. the wood, and that person has to love the wood. Yeah. Not what's in it. I started Barik because I loved wood. I, I was wor working for about six months out of the year, at another brewery in town, and I was the guy that was walking in. They called me Pigpen, and I was said, let's make sour beer, let's make sour beer, let's buy barrels, let's buy barrels. The only way that I could brew the beer in the way that I want to brew the beer was to start my own facility, and that's that's how Barique started. And I couldn't afford to hire Joel. <laughs> this is a lot of work. Can you um, just uh, let's go back to basics of brewing 101 for for the consumers listening to the show? Um, how much fermentation is occurring in a barrel versus you're fermenting in stainless and then just aging in? Like, what is your process? I guess, and I, I'm not asking you to talk for an hour about brewing because I'm sure you could. Yeah, I kind of touched on mine the other day. I mean, or, or earlier in this podcast, not the other day. Um, yeah, what day is it? What, still yeah, CBC. what day is it? This is day three of CBC. The 39th day. Um, <laughs> we open ferment in barrels. Oh, okay. And it's 80% of attenuation before it gets barreled down. Um, pretty aggressive culture and all aged or with our aged beer. We take our favorite beers and inoculate. So you're, re you're relying on natural inoculation. Yep. And then extra inoculation from the barrel. Uh, well, you're still pitching, though. Um, you're still pitching, though. Yeah, we pitch. You're pitching oh, you, in open you do pitch. In, in open fermentation, we pitch yeast, uh, but from our house culture. Okay. I, I, I would say about 25% of my cellar is wood, but those beers are in there for one, two, three, four years, and the stainless I flip every day. So my yearly production is all stainless, but my cellar is 25% wood. We do very little fermentation in barrel, if that's, it's, if that's kind of what the question was. As far as unfermented work going in barrel with yeast, we, we do very little of that. Yeah, kind of the, uh, kind of the same for me. Um, the only, in, unless we specifically state it on the, uh, on the label, um, most of my beers are either um, fermented for, gosh, four or five days to get the initial high croissant. Um, and that's literally as a cost. I just look at the at the cost savings. Uh, there's no real. I mean, there's some great tasters out there, but I was going to go. Man, this could use five more days in the barrel. So you know, just let's make more. Let's make more beer. Let's make it more widely available. So I get that initial high croissant, less cleanup too, because again, I work by myself. So I'm, you know, I've got kids. I got enough shit to clean up at home, whether than uh, you know come to work and do it. So. Um, so get the high croissant in stainless and then transfer out. And it's a more known value too. 
Um, I've done this long enough, and I'm very familiar with our cultures that I pretty much know how much, um, how many barrels I need uh, to fill. Most of the barrel, most of our batches, we do 40 barrel batches, so um, it's either 40 or 80 barrel batches that I'm barreling in. Um, the only kind of outlier of that is is when we do cool ship season, um, and all of our cool ship beers are. Uh, are in the oak within 12 hours of leaving the bull kettle. Same here. Oh, okay. Yeah, and Joel and I. Yeah, and I'm confident Joel is. He's the same way. Um, now we do have a. Uh, our cool ship is kind of like a hybrid cool ship too. It has uh, tall sides to it, so we can use it year round. So we do a lot of open fermentation. Where Joel does his in in oak casks upright. Um, I have a stainless. Um, I have a stainless like 20 barrel uh, open fermenter slash cool ship hybrid thing. That we've uh, we've actually made some clean hefeweizens in it. Um, oh. I love that different um, different uh, yeast profile that we get um, in our uh, in the cool ship fermentation for gosh, call it like three four days. Uh, we typically have only done like a very fast starting yeast, like our heavy strain. Um, but you do definitely get a different profile out of it versus when we're in the conical cylindrical it, fermenters. Is that because of oxygen exposure or is that because of hydrostatic pressure? Or I'm sorry, say it again, Don. Is that because of uh, oxygen exposure or is it because of hydrostatic pressure? Or what's I the, believe it's more sh vessel shape. I was going to say anything. geometry, yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's vessel geometry okay. in it. I think that probably we do get a little faster takeoff of, um, uh, of fermentation, of, of initial fermentation. But heavy yeast works so quickly, it might be, man, call it six hours, eight hours. Okay. Um, but when we've done, uh, we did a collab um, about three years ago with Chester King where we took, the, we took all the works um, at hot at 200 something degrees, brought it down to the, uh, brought it down to the brewery. We've got a large immersion chiller that we built out of copper that we just kind of run through. So we naturally oh, cooled it overnight, or not naturally, but, um, cooled it with like drops of water throughout the whole night and Jeffrey brought up a, a bunch of herbs from uh, from their farm so we were able to steep herbs uh, herbs from Jester King all night long by the time the morning came around the herbs had steeped we were down to about 70 80 degrees I know there was some sort of natural bioflora in there from from our cellar or what was boiling in from outside uh, but we were never trying to make like a spontaneous beer. We were just kind of trying to use the cool ship as, you know, as a cool ship, right. you know, cooling it down. Right. So uh, we took that into oak and um, and then did the fermentation and did the fermentation with our uh, local yeast. And um, Jeffrey brought up some uh, uh, mixed culture from Jester. Um, so we did so we did it kind of that way. Right. Um, and those were in uh, the barrel profile. They were all neutral barrels, but I think we added a decent amount of uh, vanilla tannins. Uh, I think for me, like I find kind of going back to what we were talking about maybe 20 minutes ago um, about what you get out of some of the barrels there, you know, we do romanticize what we, you know, you're having a barrel aged beer. It's this has been cared for in this way. But even like our second and third use barrels, one of my favorite things to come out of oak is always vanilla, vanilla and tannins out of it, um, especially hitting around the six to eight month mark. You can round out so much, you know, so much of the beer that way. Um, even beers that are really hoppy, some of ours that we've really pushed the hop limits on, they're low ABV, it would probably be kind of brash and uh, really, I don't wanna say awkward, but just like really just like right up in your face um just putting those in oak for a little while um has really rounded out the profile in a i don't want to say an unexpected way but in the best like man i hope this actually goes the way i think it is going to i'm pretty sure this is going to happen way uh even though we're not drawing out any sort of saw blanc character or anything like that we're just literally getting that sort of that micro -oxi uh, oxidation in there uh, it's a pleasing roundness of the oxidation, and it's a um, and it's a pleasing uh, tannin from the from the oak and from the wood, especially French wood. M, did you have a? Oh, um, you know, again, obviously, for the benefit of consumers, uh, in in the world of hops which everybody loves IPAs now, and like people, have, people love Citra hops, or people love Mosaic hops. You were talking about PX Sherry barrels earlier. Do you have a favorite barrel type that 
you wish consumers, when they see it on the board, on the menu board, just like if they saw a Citra hop, they'd order it. This is a barrel type that if you ever see a beer aged in this barrel, order that beer. I wish I could get more Grand Marnier barrels. Grand Marnier oh, barrels, wow. okay, cool. I, I freaking love Grand Marnier barrels, and I was able to get two of them one time um, from a European brewer that helped me out, and um, I, I loved them. Uh, they were really great, and there are some orange liqueur barrels out there, but I mean, Grand Marnier is always gonna be Grand Marnier, and it, they were freaking awesome. So yeah, I wish that that would be a thing, but it's just incredibly difficult to get those. Um, they've sold well. I just wish I could make more beer with it. I 100% agree. We used Grand Marnier barrels for one of our dopey coffee beers. I just called it French coffee, and when it came out, I was like, that was amazing. Give us 50 more. And like, no. So that yeah. was just it. That was just it. Joel, Grand Marnier, and I like cognac. I Joel used, says Malort. <laughs> I used plum jerkum barrels one time, which oh. is, is a plum cider. If oh. I could get any barrel, which I've never had, if I could get any barrel, it would be a pear brandy barrel that we make oh. a little bit of, of Tennessee grown kefir pear sour and pear brandy is my favorite spirit in the entire world. Oh really? That is awesome. So I, I actually in big picture but for clean beers I know we've mostly been fo focusing on dirty beers but for clean beers I think you should always use brandies be they grape brandies or cherry brandies or whatever because most whiskeys start as beer, right? So if you want to add a dimension, add a wrinkle, the thing captured in cognac and poire and armagnac and calvados are other flavors you can bring in. And if you clean out your barrel and take care of it, it's going to be very subtle. I love, I'd much rather fool around with brandy being, you know, fruit fermentation barrels rather than barley fermentation barrels. That being said, there's some beautiful barley fermentation barrels out there. I'll say a barrel too that I've seen a lot of pickup on, and I'm a big fan of gin, is the, I've seen a lot of breweries uh, making gin barrel beers recently that are not just like Belgian ales, not just phenolic ales that would uh, play off of the gin characteristics. Like I had a gin barrel Black Tuesday recently should not work on paper. There's no way that beer should work. But you know what? That beer was freaking awesome. It was great. And I will give credit to to True on that one. That was that was great. It really nice. was. So yeah, I, I think, you know, explore gin barrels more, not just in the way that I would do it, uh, because I'm probably just gonna do a Saison in it. So my favorite cocktail is a South Side and it's just gin plus lemon plus mint. So I just made a lemony sour through a gin barrel with mint. Eight people liked it, 8,000 people hated it. Keep going. Awesome. Em, did you have any final questions? No, this was fascinating. Really, yeah. really cool stuff. So, and congratulations uh, to all your brewery successes. You guys are doing really wonderful things. So props to you. Thank you for having us, guys. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, one more thing. Did you um, just say uh, where people can learn about your beers, social media, stuff like that before we uh, finish up? Yeah. Carton Brewing, Augie Carton, blah, 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 blah. Joel? Yeah, we're at Barik Brewing, Instagram, Facebook. Okay. Um, I'm Brandon. I um, uh, at Embrace the Funk uh, on pretty much all my social media handles. Um, Milk the Funk, and uh, then my uh, old blog that I have not updated in a while, uh, EmbraceTheFunk.com. And uh, any John Hall podcast that I could get my um, get my voice on. I got the he got surrounded by 21 Relk beers. <laughs> Woo. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Cheers. All right, Em, tell me how much more you love Barely's beer now. So much more. <laughs> <laughs> There it's was sort so of like um, on Spinal Tap where like you're at 10. But yeah. But you're we can, yeah, exactly. Let's turn up you're to 11. 11. <laughs> I also really want to do, a, I've never had a beer in Grand Marnier barrels. Right. Uh, same. I agree like, with that. Yeah. And they're like um, plum cider and all of this. I just really liked how there's so much innovations for something that's so old. Right. <laughs> but it's like thing like, and the fact that you can, I really, like, it's very interesting how you can just, like, call a guy now and be like, yo, give me a PX Sherry Barrel. 
and then, uh, and then like 10 days later they're like here you go sir yeah. and i'm like it's <laughs> like that's so crazy yeah it's it's become a whole industry in and of itself yeah it's uh, very, it's really cool and i even, just um uh, I'm sorry, Em. I, I was no, just no, say... no. I'm just, I, we're talking over each other because one, we do that all the time. And two, <laughs> because we're both because really excited. I'm so excited. I feel like my catchphrase for this, for this podcast is that's so exciting. Exclamation point. Like that's literally what I say every episode. I feel like there could be a drinking game. It, but it is, a, it's a whole industry now, barrel aged beer. Like uh, obviously this episode was recorded during Craft Brewers Conference. Mm -hmm. And for those who don't know, there's also a big trade show attached. And, you, you know, if you walk the trade show, it's not just, you know, breweries, brew houses and hops and malts. There's also, there are barrel brokers there. And then even like um, barrel filling equipment. Because if you think about, if, you know, for people who have visited breweries, um, uh, fermentation vessels obviously have uh, valves to remove the beer, but barrels don't. So you need a thing to put in the barrel to take the beer out and and uh, and then um, the racks that the barrels get uh, stacked on. And, you know, that's a whole it's a whole yeah. industry. It's a, and then if you don't have the space for full oak barrels, you can do spirals, staves. I mean, there's so much you can do using the equipment that you already have if you're just stainless. So it's yeah. it's cool how you can would impart so many different. Yeah, it's it's a huge. It's an industry in itself, like you said. I wonder. Uh, maybe I should set myself a goal to only drink barrel aged beer for the rest of the year. Oh dear oh, God! <laughs> a lot of those are high high test. <laughs> but uh, no, you I'm do not you do, do you don't do that. Uh, or you could, but don't you know moderation, Don moderation. Yes, that's true. <laughs> all right, everybody, visit allaboutbeer.com and follow us on social media at allaboutbeer, and please visit patreon.com/slash allaboutbeer to support this show and others. If you have questions for the experts, email us at podcast at allaboutbeer.com. That's also the email for feedback, suggestions, or to inquire about supporting this show through advertising. Speaking of advertising, here's a short word from our sponsors. Looking for an easy hop sourcing experience? Yakima Valley Hops offers the finest quality hops from right here in our valley and premium growing regions around the world. Get the hops you need when you need them with ultra fast shipping and awesome customer service. With a full line of liquid hop products and all your favorite varieties, no contracts are needed to brew with the best. Shop now at yakimavalleyhops.com. That's Y-A-K-I-M-A, -A, valleyhops.com. All About Beer is back, and we're asking for your support to help provide the independent beer media this rich and colorful industry deserves. Visit our website, allaboutbeer.com, where we're frequently posting new content. And please consider throwing us a few bucks at patreon.com slash allaboutbeer. We have low-cost memberships for individuals and small and large companies alike. Every dollar goes to help produce new articles and podcasts. Estrella Galicia is an independent family-owned brewery in Northwest Spain, founded in 1906. Estrella Galicia Cerveza Especial is a world-class lager, brewed using the finest Spanish malts, locally cultivated Galician hops, and the best brewing practices made out of the state-of-the-art facility in Acruña. Recognized around the world for quality and exceptional character, Estrella Galicia is a beer like no other. To learn more about Estrella Galicia, follow them at Estrella Galicia USA on Instagram. Before we go, if you like this podcast, one easy thing you can do to help us is to give us a five-star review on your favorite podcasting app. That helps other people find the show. We would also appreciate it if you would let your beer-loving friends know about the show to help us spread the gospel of good beer. Em, how can people reach out to you? I am at Pints and Panels across all social media platforms, and my website is www.pintsandpanels.com. What about you, Don? I am at The Dawn of Beer on Twitter and Instagram. And people can drop me an email at dawn at thedawnofbeer.com. This show is produced by All About Beer. Visit allaboutbeer.com for articles, notes on this show and others, and to connect via the newsletter and social media. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.